Yeah, so question number three we have uh, from 1 Corinthians 11.32 that, uh, that we should not be condemned with the world. If Paul wanted to communicate eternal security, wouldn't it be better for Paul to write and we will not be condemned with the world or just leave that part out altogether? Is this the teaching that salvation could that theoretically be lost and we'd be judged with the world if God did not chasten us or even take us from this world early? Okay. Uh, all right, I'll go ahead and go first. Renee, let us know when you're available again. Uh, she's probably uh, tied up. James was calling on her earlier. Uh, well, I would say that uh, my fallback position and I, I think this is advisable to everybody, uh, is the, is the um, uh, let's say, the, the principle that we, our doctrines are formed from the Bible verses that are explicit, um, that there's, uh, they clearly state something, uh, and they are unambiguous, uh, and also they are repeated. And uh, the, the three core doctrines that we espouse as essential doctrines that the deity of Christ, faith alone for salvation and eternal security, in, in any of those three, we could offer you dozens and even hundreds of verses that are clear, that are so clear that a little, let's say a 10 year old child with the most basic rudimentary understanding of Eng English language could clearly understand but without any help. And they, they clearly state these, these doctrines and it's repeated over and over and over again. When we have that, then we can be confident that we've got the right doctrine. Uh, then we encounter what they call uh, problem verses. See, the verses I just mentioned, these are what we would call proof texts. They prove our position. Uh, the problem texts are like the James verse that we talked about earlier. This verse here could be a problem text. And there are uh, dozens of problem texts that people say, well, what about this verse? And what about that verse? And, and uh, we can always give them an answer. Uh, sometimes it's just the context. Sometimes it's a, a, an idiom, uh, just a, a way of speech that was used at that time. Uh, but really... What, what trumps all of that is that if you have uh, a doctrine clearly stated uh, over and over and over again, why would you let uh, um, these uh, ambiguous verses that everybody's arguing about the meaning, why, how would you let that hamper your confidence in all these clear verses? But and, and the, the use of the word should is the problem here. Uh, let me see. So uh, the verse says in the KJV, I guess, I, I'm not sure what version he's quoted here, but he says that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, there's other cases where we see the word should and people could, could ask, well, why does it say should? Why doesn't it say, as they say here, we will not be condemned? Uh, <clears throat> and, and it's just, it's just the, the language, the way that the language was used. It's uh, the way that people speak at that time. And it, uh, they understood that wasn't mean, well, should means that, uh, well, it's a possibility. Uh, we should, but it, it's not necessarily so. No, uh, it is absolute. Even though it says should, we, they understood that is absolute, not, not possible, not possibly. Uh, so <clears throat> um, all the other ver verses that say should, that you would, could also bring up in this uh, context, it's the same thing. It's just that's the way that the language was uh, translated. Um, and if, if you've looked at other translations, perhaps even if you looked at, uh, I like the uh, Young's Literal Translation, a lot, a lot of times that clears these things up too. Um, I don't normally go to the Greek or the Hebrew. Uh, some people uh, go to that and they're quite good at it. But uh, uh, you, you, can, you can get to the bottom of this, but really, the bottom line is don't let these problem verses uh, interfere with your confidence in the clear, explicit verses that, that are, uh, there's mountains of them. All right, let's see if Renee is uh, back yet. Renee? Yes, I'm back. 
sorry mm-hmm. about that. It was my daddy. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right, Ray. Uh, did you hear the ver- the the question and, and the answer yes. at all? Yes. Uh, okay. Now I want to say uh, amen to Luke because the way they spoke, especially in Old English, is weird. It's like, uh, let, for instance, let's go over to Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Uh, there's also places like you would not, uh, ways we use words we don't really use. Um, and so should and hope are often uh given like a modern day uh understanding of the words they can be used that way uh like you should do this or that um but this is not saying that it's not saying it's conditional it's saying but when we are judged we are chastened of the lord that we should not be condemned with the world see that we should not be condemned with the world. So here's the thing. It is clearly saying the reason Christians, a believer, does not get away with sin is because we are not condemned with the unbelieving world. And because of God's uh, justice, It says he loves who he loves, he rebukes and chastens, right? He does not chasten his enemies. He he hopes that they repent and turn to him, but until then, the wrath of God abides on them, right? He doesn't chasten them. His, His goal is not to make them live better or straighten up their act. His goal is to save them so that they would turn to him in faith. Um, but if they don't, they will be condemned in the end. And so when a Christian does these things, he chastens them because it's correction, right? It's correction so that the body of Christ isn't harmed and it's for our own good because sin brings death. And if we continue on that path, it can destroy us, destroy others give the church a bad name, destroy our testimony, everything, right? Um, So the verse here, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So the words there is like put quotations that were, we should not be condemned, that we should not be condemned with the world. We're not condemned with the world. So it's it's hard to uh, explain the wording. They're, they're, the way they talked was quite different, but it's not saying you you might be condemned with the world or uh, if you, where's the condition there? But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, where's the condition? The, if, if there was a condition there, it would say, when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, or maybe he won't chasten us and we might be condemned with it. I mean, there's no like, all he's saying is for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. There's another should. You see that? If we were saying it today, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But that's not how it's written. There's the way it's, look, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So the should there is like, would not. So it's just the way they talk. And and Paul is just saying, look, if us as a church would be mindful first of ourselves and mindful of the brethren and correct our own behaviors before they got out of hand, then God wouldn't have to chasten us, right? So if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. That's how God judges his people, all right? Here's the rest of it, that we should not be condemned with the world. So the should's there, it's just weird how it's written. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We would not be judged. 
It's just how it's worded. But to me, it's clear that when we're, he's saying judge ourselves so that God won't have to judge us. And when he does judge us, it's a chastening, not a condemnation. All right. So the way Christians are corrected is different than the world because the wrath that God abides on them, not on us. And I, I think that's just, Paul explaining it, that they need to take care of what's going on in that church. There were a lot of wicked things going on in that church. And he's advising them to get a hold of it before God spanks your butt because he chastens whom he loves. It says that clearly. And if you're not chastened, you're not his child. All right. Brother Jordan, you heard our answers. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think those are great answers. And when we're talking about those who are on milk, that is definitely the Corinthian church. I think one thing we have to consider is Paul wasn't contemplating the things that would be up for debate in the 21st century. They were so busy fighting other things like the Roman government, Gnosticism, uh, Judaism. You know, there were so many things rising up against the early Christians. I'm just... I feel that eternal security, I mean, that word wouldn't have existed, but things like eternal life, everlasting life, those things would have existed. I think it was just pretty much well assumed, you know, you pass from death onto life and you don't pass back to death, you know? So um, the one thing I want to address here is, you know, when you have these problem verses, go back, not just read the whole chapter, read the whole book, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it tells us very clearly how we are judged in accordance to what this verse is referring to paul lays it out perfectly uh verses so chapter 3 verses 11 through 15 for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day sh shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a, a reward. If any, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So one thing we have to remember is we are judged according to our works because we are saved unto good works, but we are spared ourselves. So the question then becomes, okay, Paul, well, how do we get to that place? How do we make Jesus the foundation of our life? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. The moment you trust in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are sealed, you are set apart, and you began your sanctification journey. And everything you do within that sanctification journey is either going to result in heavenly rewards, or you are going to make a lot of smoke in heaven that day. And it is probably going to be very embarrassing with all of creation staring at your works, and they're just being smoked everywhere. Oh, man, that's a very graphic picture you painted for me, brother. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Oh. Brother Luke, I, I yes. didn't really answer the second part of the question. I didn't realize it. I want to, okay. you go, because if you haven't gone, I will answer no. after you. No, I went first. Go ahead. Okay. So the second part of the question was, does this mean, you know, like uh, you can lose salvation theor theoretically and be judged with the world? We did answer that part. No, it does not mean that. Uh, if God didn't chasten us or take us from this world early, uh, no, but, uh, Ben brought up something good. Uh, the context of this here, he's saying that the Corinthian church didn't realize they were already being chastened and Paul's letting them know why some of them are sick and weakly and some had even died. And we read this when we do the Lord's supper, uh, you know, these verses are used out of context you know if you drink 
and eat unworthily, which is the process of eating and drinking badly, meaning they, they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and overeating and not thinking about the poor or feeding the poor. So uh, this was why the things they were doing, not setting apart his body and blood, not discerning the Lord's body, not remembering uh, that it was broken for their healing and that his blood was shed for their sin. So instead of contemplating this and setting it apart as sacred, God was chastening them for abusing it and and treating it as an unholy, you know, party or something. And so that's why it says, let a man examine himself and eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I think damnation there is a strong word because it gives the connotation other than what the connotation is. Uh, it doesn't mean eternal damnation, but more of a condemnation or a consequence. And so for this cause, what cause? What they were just talking about. Many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So some are sick and weak and some had died. And then he says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So that is the, the context of why, in addition to everything they had done being carnal and, and fornication among them and stuff, Paul, as Ben pointed out, these people had no idea that God was chastening them. And that's why some of them had died and were sick. So um, that's what's going on there. And at the very last, it says, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you will come not together under condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So he's like, you know, don't you have a house where you can do that? You don't come here and gobble everything up. This is the Lord's Supper. It is sacred. We contemplate his body and blood here. Um, and so they had no idea. You know, they were carnal. They had no idea that some of them had died and were sick because of that, that God was actually chastening them. And so that is really the motivation for the verse. Hey, you're yeah, you're getting judged right now. The reason you guys are sick and stuff, God's judging you, this church. And here's why. And then says, if you judge yourself, you could avoid this kind of chastening of God, right? And then he says, the reason God has to do it is because we're not judged with the world in the end that doesn't believe. We're not condemned with the unbelievers. God, God's justice and, and love for his son demands that he chasten people for this. Um, so that, that's the whole motivation for, in context for Paul doing that.